shipping. Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 7th of November. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather service information. You can do that easily by giving us a call on the Alaska Weather Information Line, 1-800-472-0391. Find us online at weather.gov slash Alaska. Whether you're looking for aviation information, river information, or your local weather forecast, simply clicking on the map will get you started. And if you can't find what you need, give me an email, david.snyder at noaa.gov is an easy way to find me, and I usually reply as quickly as I can. Here's a take, uh, let's take a look at the warnings, watches, and advisories out for Alaska this evening. We're going to start up north and work our way south where there's a lot going on and some areas have multiple warnings in effect at this point. Let's start with the Brooks Range. Mainly for the south facing slopes you're going to be dealing with a winter weather advisory for snowfall and blowing snow. That means poor visibility especially west of the Dalton Highway. Uh, this could include uh, up to about 7 to 11 inches of snow in some cases there so uh, do expect significant snowfall and poor visibility. Now north of that a winter weather advisory for just blowing snow. That means, generally speaking, visibilities are going to suffer, but you're not looking at additional snowfall. As you look up the coast, you're going to be dealing with high surf advisories there from Barrow southward. And as you move south of the Brooks Range summits, you're back into snow again. And some of this could be pretty heavy, especially for the Kobuk and Noatak valleys. Uh, we're expecting to see um, anywhere from about 4 to 7 inches of snow in some cases, maybe on the order of 12 to 15 as you get out toward uh, the Kobuk and Noatak valleys, especially the lower Kobuk and Noatak, uh, that will last until 6 a.m. on Thursday. There will be a significant amount of snow east of that, too, into the upper Kobuk and Noatak, including places north of Ambler. Uh, you should expect to see uh, as much as 15 inches of snow in those regions, uh, 5 to 7 inches in general, but some places in this red shaded area here could see a foot of snow on top of what you already have by the time we wake up on Thursday morning. So there will be more snow here. As you move further southward, you're looking at high surf conditions and coastal flooding possibilities there from Cape Cruz and Stern and along the uh, area, uh, along the northern coast of the Seward Peninsula and southward as well. As you get into the Nulato Hills and the interior of the Seward Peninsula, it's going to be snow. Some of that could be heavy, four to about seven inches or so in general. St. Lawrence Island, looking at high surf conditions and coastal flooding possible there and all the way down to the Yukon Delta. There will be significant wave run up and uh, there could be uh, 6 to uh, 13 foot uh, seas just offshore. So again, there will be some pretty high seas very close to the coast and significant wave run up on top of normal high tide. So be prepared for a, a push of onshore flow there. And uh, again, a lot of this will start to ramp up as we head into the evening hours and into early tomorrow morning. Uh, many other areas eastward will see winter weather conditions lasting at least until about Thursday morning. So a lot going on for the north and for the west, again with heavy snow, strong winds, wave run up, and perhaps some coastal flooding in there with coastal flood warnings in effect for many areas uh, across the uh, north of the Yukon Delta, the Seward Peninsula, and uh, as you head further northward as well, coastal flood advisories looking northward. So Again, pay attention to your local weather information there and make sure you stay up to date on your latest so you can continue to protect you and your village. Here's a look at the satellite picture and we have a very sharp edge on the back edge of this uh, latest front and what that tells us is there's a lot of cold air driving this, uh, moving it eastward and you can see that uh, uh, this is marching eastward fairly quickly but behind that another wave of colder air is developing and this will power a cold front working its way from um, the central Bering Sea eastward. Uh, this is going to be a significant snow producer again for the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range and as we were talking about that could be upwards of uh, 6 to 12 inches of snow in general across some of the north and western mountains there especially the south facing slopes there in the Kobuk and Noatak Range but also for some of the other higher terrain there in the Seward Peninsula and north of the Yukon Delta. So. The snow will be flying and 
As this moves eastward, it looks like it has the potential of producing about three to five inches in general across the interior. So an awful lot going on there as this sweeps eastward. Eventually, could see some more snow showers in south central. In the meantime, high pressure is pushing uh, low pressure out of the way across southeastern Alaska. Still getting some breezes there, of course, and a little bit of light rain across the southern parts of the Panhandle. But this is filling in. This is moving to the south and to the south and east with cold high pressure still in place across south central. Clouds are moving back in from Bristol Bay all the way to Kodiak Island. Not a whole lot of precipitation there or for the Aleutian chain at this point. Here's a look at the weather map, and low pressure is still spiraling there in the southern part of the Gulf at 980 millibars. We have a high in the western parts of Canada, nearly 1,040 millibars, areas of fog around that. But the snow is flying from the Yukon Delta all the way into the upper Koyukuk, and uh, not just west of the Dalton to the Chukchi Sea coast, out around Point Hope to Point Lay, and southward toward Kotzebue. 1,000 millibar high, or low I should say, um, down around the Gulf of Anadir. Front stretching all the way into the Aleutians. That's the second surge of cold air that will be working with the precipitation. And heavy snow showers and uh, periods of snow expected to fall across the central and western interior all the way out toward Point Hope and uh, down toward uh, the Yukon Delta and even into Bristol Bay in some places there. Uh, drier conditions to the south around the Pribilovs and then back toward the west. Uh, rain showers expected uh, just a little bit uh, well, from Kiska out toward Attu. We'll still see some rain showers across southern parts of southeast tonight as high pressure is filling in the gaps. And you can see it's pushing that storm further and further away at 990 millibars. The pressure gradient should relax as we get into Wednesday. So breezy, but certainly not windy in most cases as we head through your Wednesday. Watch for periods of snow, some of that heavy across the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range. And once again, this pressure gradient will be tight. There will be an awful lot of wind moving ashore and into the bays and uh, areas right up against the northern Yukon coastline, all the way up through the Chukchi Sea and along uh, areas up toward Barrow. So the water will be moving and being pushed further inland than normal, so pay attention to that. Low pressure sweeping across the Bering Sea will continue moving eastward. As we get into Thursday, maybe latching on to some colder air, creating a, perhaps a brief cold front there, but the important consideration for you is that Snow will spread further eastward, and once again, there may be some accumulations by the time we reach the end of the week of about three to five inches or so across the central and eastern interior. That's not a winter storm warning, but it's enough that might slow you down if you're trying to move north or south along the road system. Out across the west, you can still see snow stretching into the Seward Peninsula, the Yukon Delta, all the way to the Chukchi Coast. And again, winter storm warnings are expected to stay until early Thursday morning. But something to keep in mind is this storm here at 987 millibars. This looks to approach the region as we head into the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, and make another run of wind and snow and perhaps even coastal flooding. This looks like it will be a significant storm. And so today is Tuesday, and we're talking about a weather situation that is coming up on Saturday and Sunday. You have days and days to prepare for this one, but it does look like it will be a significant storm. So make sure you're keeping an eye on the weather system that's moving off of eastern Asia uh, as we head toward Thursday, Friday, and then into Saturday. Okay, Here is a look at the temperatures as we go into tomorrow morning. It's going to be cold. It's dry across the eastern interior. Low temperatures either at zero or below to about 10 below or so, most in southeast in the 20s and 30s. South central, teens and 20s, Kodiak 32. Uh, Ambler about four with the snow there. Uh, or, sorry, Bettles, uh, Ambler about 18. Uh, teens to about 20 degrees for the north coast and 29 around Nome. Upper 20s to lower 30s for most of the southwest coast. 38 around St. Paul and upper 30s to 40s for the Alaska Peninsula and the chain. As we get into the afternoon tomorrow, uh, single digits around Northway, 13 in Eagle, 24 for Fairbanks, 20s for most of the north slope. Uh, you're looking at low 30s around Kotzebue Sound. Mid to upper 30s for most of Norton Sound, you know, Laclede around 35, about the same for uh, Savunga and southwest, you're looking at temps closer to 40 degrees. Bethel may be a little bit cooler at 36, 31 around McGrath. South central back in the mid 20s to uh, nearly 40 degrees as you head down toward Homer and Seward, uh, and 42 in Kodiak, upper 30s to low 40s for most of southeast. St. Paul, 42. Overnight low temperatures for your Thursday morning. Remember that wet and cold air is moving eastward and that's gradually eroding some of the dry air we see here. Arctic Village, 5 below, uh, Golcana, 9 below. Other than that, uh, temp should be 0 or above, around Northway, 0. Uh, low to mid-teens for most of the Beaufort Sea Coast, Barrow at 19, Cottesview, 18, Shishmaruff, 21, Nome, 24. Uh, Galena, you're looking at temps in the mid-20s with uh, McGrath back in the upper 20s, Bethel near 27. Bristol Bay temperature is nearing 30 degrees, 30s and 40s for the Alaska Peninsula, Sandpoint, 37. 
St. Paul and St. George expect highs, uh, lows on Thursday back at 35 and 40 for Adak and Atka. Southeast will start out temperatures in the 20s and 30s. South Central in the teens and 20s with highs recovering into the lower to mid 30s for South Central. Warming up for Homer at 41, 42 in Kodiak. For Yukon, 20 degrees, 25 in Barrow and upper 30s and lower 40s for a large part of Southeast before another round of cold moves your way. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. On to flying weather now, IFR will continue across many locations in the Koyukuk in the middle and lower Yukon Valleys, Norton Sound, Seward Peninsula, and the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, where we're continuing to see snow, that onshore and steady westerly flow crossing through the bearing and running into the terrain across the central and western interior. We're still seeing MVFR across the southern edge of the outer coast of southeast as that storm system pulls away as we get into the afternoon on Wednesday. That should be eliminated as drier air flows back into the region but we don't see a whole lot of change out across the west. So get there and stay there or don't expect to go there uh, if you're out there across western Alaska for many locations. There's some uh, possibility of travel there perhaps around the upper end of uh, Kotzebue Sound closer to uh, Kotzebue and Shishmaref itself, but uh, it's going to be pretty hit and miss. You can see MVFR also spreading eastward and IFR spreading eastward along the north coast as we get into Thursday morning. Some of that does improve, but we're still looking at widespread IFR across the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range and also spreading into the Tanana Valley in some places and also into Bristol Bay and across the Aleutian Range and the western Alaska Range. For your Thursday morning, MVFR continues for many locations out in the west, but some improvement may be noted along the lower and middle Yukon Valley itself. As we get into Thursday afternoon, watch for another wave to come ashore across the Chukchi Coast and into the Kotzebue Sound region. IFR there. Hit and miss IFR across the northern interior and still lingering across the western Alaska Range. Southeast still looking pretty good. South Central will start to see some MVFR across some of the higher terrain and perhaps Tanita Pass now for the Central Aleutians and the Pribilovs. Watch for developing MVFR there through Thursday afternoon. Here's your pass conditions in detail now. Anaktuvik Pass and Adigan Pass, as you just saw, will likely be listed at IFR through most of the daytime on Wednesday. Lee Clark and Merrill Pass, we expect to start at VFR, but leaning over toward IFR, especially on the western side as we go through your Wednesday. Rainy Pass will be a little slower to push over toward MVFR and IFR in the afternoon, but that transition does look to take shape. Windy Pass, we expect to see IFR through most of the day. Isabel Pass looking to start at IFR but then heading over toward MVFR as your afternoon goes on. Mentasta Pass right now still looks to be in the clear for VFR through Wednesday. Tanita Pass, we expect to lean over toward IFR as the day goes on. Portage Pass right now, VFR. Watch for winds to develop later in the week. And Chilkoot and White Pass at this point looking to be VFR. The freezing levels show a little bit of a warm bubble here just east of Demarcation Point, but the big changes are what we're seeing out here across the Bering Sea. With a westerly flow now, it's pretty easy for that colder air to drop southward, and that warm air aloft has been pushed south of the Aleutians and into the eastern Gulf, with levels between two, four, and 6,000 feet for southeastern Alaska, and about two to 4,000 feet across the central and eastern chain and parts of south-central Alaska, most of the state, of course, below freezing. Uh, the icing potential, then you can see uh, just a little bit of uh, threat there across the Bering Sea, St. Matthew reaching toward the Privlovs, and then once it gets into the mainland, the air is really drying out. Uh, the most recent boundary moving ashore has levels around one to 4,000 feet or so, and most of that seems to be isolated moderate. We're still dealing with some lingering icing potential across central and southern parts of southeast. That is above 4,000 feet for your Wednesday. A look at the jet stream shows that we've gone from that very high amplitude ridge and trough pattern to something that's at least a little bit more zonal, what we call a west to easterly flow in the weather world. Uh, you'll notice the wind speeds there running from about 90 to 95 knots or so coming in off the bearing. And the stronger Pacific jet stream is a little bit further south, is still wrapping into that low pressure system across the central Gulf, and its strong southerly winds are still reaching into parts of southeastern Alaska. As more of this pattern becomes our predominant flow, we'll continue to see wave after wave coming off the Bering Sea in eastern Asia, producing wind, cold, and snow for many locations. At 9,000 feet then, here is our very broad westerly pattern, 40 to 60 knots coming in across the central and northern Bering, and 40 knots up north, you're looking at 20 to 30 knots down south, and for southeast, still under the influence of that eastern Gulf storm with 15 to 20 knots coming off of the higher terrain. 
at 3,000 feet. Again, a very broad westerly flow. This is conducive to a very active pattern again with storm after storm coming through. Wind speeds through the Bering Strait running around 50 knots or so, 50 knots over the Privlovs and westerlies over the Aleutians 20 to 30 and 25 to 35 knots around the eastern Alaskan interior and wind speeds here across the eastern Gulf still, still being pulled in by that low pressure system up to 45 knots over Haida Gwaii. So turbulence is really going to focus up north as we go through your Wednesday. Watch for areas of considerable moderate across the north slope around the western Brooks Range, the Seward Peninsula, Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, the northern Yukon Delta, St. Lawrence Island, and areas in the eastern Brooks Range, most of that below four and 6,000 feet. We'll be back with a look at your rain weather in just a moment. It's a complicated project, but a simple life. You can study whales all over the world, you can study harbor seals all over the world, but you cannot study them in silence all over the world. So we really need this sort of piece of wilderness, this untrammeled wilderness, as they say, in order to answer some of these questions. So we've been monitoring underwater sound here in Glacier Bay since May of 2000. And the reason why we're doing that is to understand what the park is like from the perspective of a marine mammal, because marine mammals are very dependent on the natural sound environment. If you sort of bring it back to humans, humans respond to noise in very stereotypical ways, and uh, other mammals do the same thing. So, you know, if you go to a concert with your buddy and if the music's really loud, you're going to talk at a higher pitch you're gonna talk louder and you might have to repeat yourself and marine mammals do the same thing if it gets noisy. So we're seeing, you know, just which of those three that they actually do. We're here on Strawberry Island for the entire summer. We sample eight to 12 hours a day. There'll be two people who are on our beach station doing scans, marking each whale in the area. Two people who are doing focal follows from our tower, which is a temporary tower that we have set up here on Strawberry Islands. And then we have two people who are in the kayak who are doing fine scale acoustic sampling for harbor seals. Got a harbor seal at 23 meters. Got it. What's her bearing? Bearing is five, eight, two, two, one, two, one. Being able to pair what an animal is saying with where the animal is saying it is, is an amazing <laughs> data set. It's a hard data set to get. It takes a lot of work, but it can answer so many questions. So our cruise ship right here in the background is right on time today. We have a blissful hour and a half before the cruise ship gets here where we can watch our whales in silence. And then our ship comes in, bringing with it the noise that it brings. And we watch our whales while the ship's here to see whether or not their behavior is changing. And then it's going to go up bay, and bring passengers to go see the glaciers. And we are going to get that blissful quiet again to see whether or not our whales are going back to that natural behavior. This is the computer that runs our underwater acoustic monitoring. And there's a five mile cable from my office that leads out to a hydrophone that's out recording live sounds in Glacier Bay. And if I turn this up a little bit louder for the moment, that's the sound of a male harbor seal roaring because it's the mating season. Building a good field team and building some good camaraderie is really important. We have sort of these daily routines of things that we do together. So there's a schedule that we check every morning, who's gonna cook lunch that day, who's gonna cook dinner. And then every day we take a group photo. And then every day we do a daily check-in. We mm -hmm. talk about what worked that day, what didn't work that day, and what we learned either from the island or from each other over the course of the day. Surface nine zero zero six zero zero. Last night, there were anywhere from eight to ten individuals uh, right along the kelp bed off the point. And we were trying to figure out exactly what they were doing. So, as acousticians, Michelle and I uh, got a hydrophone. That seemed like the right <laughs> thing to do. Put the hydrophone in the water to see what was going on. Well, we dropped the hydrophone and it was so quiet. 
There was not a single roar. Nothing. We heard nothing. It was just so unusual. One of the things we did observe yesterday was two large bull killer whales who had come into the area that we learned today were transient killer whales. They do come into this area to hunt harbor seals. This is a pupping ground. That's mm -hmm. what they come in for. Yep. We cannot in any way, shape or form definitively link the presence of ma mammal eating killer whales with the silence of harbor seals. No, but it is quite interesting that they happened at the exact same time. It's always an adventure in Strawberry Island. You never know what the day's gonna bring. This morning at 5.15 in the morning, the area was just boiling with whales. I had one 15 minute scan this morning where I was literally hopping back and forth on either side of the theodolite, calling out numbers to try and get all the whales as quickly as possible. And then 15 minutes later, we couldn't find them. Aside from getting to be outside all the time, my favorite part of doing my PhD is getting to work with Leanna. Um, it goes both ways. It helps when you put two minds that think differently <laughs> onto the same problem. Global ocean noise is a real problem. And there are areas of the ocean that have underwater sound from vessels so often that you could almost consider it an urban environment. Glacier Bay is a very remote area and it was set aside as a national park in part to do scientific research. And we're privileged to be able to use it as a natural laboratory where we can better understand the impacts of underwater noise. There are some places that act like characters in your life. And I, I think that a lot of Alaskans can resonate with the fact that living here is like having another family member. It's like having somebody really, really important who's sort of nudging you to be a little uncomfortable all the time <laughs> and to stretch yourself all the time because it's worth it. I've lived here for almost 10 years. I've made Alaska my home, and so I'm an Alaskan by choice. And now, Marine weather around Alaska. Time for a quick check of your sea ice conditions. Ice is filling in now across the Beaufort Sea coast from the east to the central coastline. We saw a larger area of open water yesterday. That is filling in very quickly with a very thin sheen of ice, and that process should continue. One thing that's going to hold it back across the west, though, is the strong winds from the south across the Chukchi Sea and the Kotzebue Sound region, but do expect some growth once those winds settle down. You can keep tabs on the latest sea ice conditions at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice. On to southeast now, gusty conditions will start to improve as we get into the rest of the week. One place that may not see rapid improvement, though, will be up around the Northernland Canal and Skagway. Northerlies there with five-foot seas expected north and easterlies down the rest of the central and southern inner channels. The outer coast still looking at an offshore flow from Cross Sound all the way down to the Dixon entrance. 15 to 25 knot winds with 16-foot seas on the outside of Dixon entrance. And notice the winds as we get into Thursday, getting into uh, more of a uniform flow from the north and west. 20 knots all the way up to a Yakutat. Northerlies remain strong around Skagway. Seven foot seas there and 10 to 20 knot winds. A much nicer day down around the Clarence Strait and the Misty Fjords. Looking for two foot seas there on Thursday. Inside of Prince William Sound, 15 knots uh, from the north and west with a two foot sea. Look for north and westerlies as you get uh, down the Kenai Fjords region out toward Resurrection Bay. 30 knots east of the Barrens, westerlies west of the Barrens, 7 foot seas there, and northerlies in Cook Inlet, 10 to 15 knots with 2 to 3 foot seas in the region. As we get into Thursday, a much stronger flow develops over the Barrens, north and westerlies, 40 to 45, high gales with 10 to 12 foot seas. Inside of Prince William Sound, northwesterlies, 10 knots with a 2 foot sea, and 25 to 30 knots outside of Prince William Sound and down uh, outside of Resurrection Bay with a 10 foot sea on Thursday. Inside of Bristol Bay, westerlies at 15 knots with a 5-foot sea. Uh, continuing down the uh, Bering Sea coast with an 8-foot sea. And inside of Shalikov Strait, 20 knots with a 5-foot sea. 11 to 12-foot seas elsewhere east of Kodiak Island and down the Pacific coast for Wednesday. For Thursday, still looking at west and northwesterly winds in the entire region, about 25 to 30 knots. 10-foot seas east of Kodiak Island down towards Sand Point. And looking at 9 to 11-foot seas across the Bering Sea coast. Inside of Bristol Bay, 25 knots. 
from the north and west for your Thursday afternoon. Across the Aleutians, we're already getting back into that south and westerly flow again. You're looking at 10 to 15 knots across the Pacific coast, 20 to 25 across the Bering Sea coast, and generally 8 to 9 foot seas in most areas. There are slightly higher seas as a next wave moves across the open waters of the Bering, but won't have much of an impact there on the winds. It will be more of the high pressure system that's controlling that, with westerlies uh, becoming southerly across Kiska to Shemia, 30 knots, 8 foot seas there, and more of a northwesterly flow, 10 to 20 across the central and eastern chain, with 6 to 10 foot seas in the central and eastern parts of the region as we get into Thursday. Across the west coast, a steady southwest flow from St. Paul and St. George in Norton Sound. 8 to 15 foot seas across the region. You're looking at 11 foot seas around St. Paul and St. George. 8 foot seas coming into uh, the uh, Kuskokwim Delta region. And once again, this has some concerns for some coastal flooding as we get into the daytime on Wednesday. Uh, most areas will be seeing a surge above normal high tide. So uh, concerns for many up and down the west coast as a result of that. As we get into Thursday, winds coming in more from the west again, and this could affect different places with different amounts of water. Uh, look for some of this to improve, though, as we get into uh, the mid to late morning hours of Thursday. But concerns will also be watching for a different uh, uh, setup as we get into the weekend. So Saturday and Sunday could raise similar concerns for uh, coastal flooding and stronger winds as we get into the weekend there. Here's a look at uh, Wednesday, and you can see uh, south and westerly is coming up the Chukchi Coast, 30 to 35. You're looking at 11 to 14 foot seas there. Also 15 foot seas north of St. Lawrence Island. Uh, for the Beaufort Sea Coast, notice winds aren't quite as strong here, 15 to 25, as more of a south and southeasterly flow with three to six foot seas in the open waters, and it's still holding around four to five foot seas there on Thursday. Again, any amount of wind is going to chew up a lot of the ice that's forming there. It's not very strong just yet. And there's our westerly push coming ashore for the Chukchi Coast and into the Kotzebue Sound region. Again, watching for those coastal flooding concerns through the early parts of Thursday. That's a look at your sea forecast. Let's take a look at what's going on around the weather one more time. Uh, snow may be heavy, will be heavy across the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys tonight. A winter storm warning continues there and some places may see anywhere from 6 to 12 inches of snow. For the Brooks Range and travel around the Dalton Highway, uh, blowing snow may be an issue, reducing visibility there. And strong winds as well as a push of coastal water may be coming into the west and northwestern coast. High surf and coastal flood warnings are in effect right now uh, for your community there. Make sure you check out the very latest at weather.gov slash Alaska anytime. For southeast, winds are going to ease up a little bit more. You'll get a little bit of a nicer day on Thursday, and the lookout west shows that a new storm is shaping up for the weekend, and it looks like it will be a strong one for northwestern Alaska. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.